Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to DC Refers Reconnect. We are thrilled today to have Nicole Stevens, the Registrar of Wills and Director of the Probate Division of DC Superior Court with us. And um, glad to see so many people able to join us today. As we get started, um, my name is Nancy Lopez and I'm a board member with DC Refers. And I wanna tell you a little bit about DC Refers, who we are and what we do. DC Refers is an online directory of lawyers and mediators who provide high quality legal services to people of modest means. Modest means for us means people who earn between 200 and 400% of the federal poverty guidelines. And the lawyers and mediators on our panel agree to charge those income qualified uh, clients between 75 and $150 per hour for their services. DC Refers is also a trusted source of referrals for clients of all income levels. And that's important for two reasons. One is if you're a lawyer mediator on our panel and you encounter someone who found you through DC Refers but is over income, you're free to charge your regular or negotiated rate. And also if you're referring people to DC Refers to look for legal or mediation services, we are happy to have people of any income level come and try and find the services they need through our directory. Clients come to DC Refers from a variety of different sources, which is probably not surprising. There are lots of people who need legal help, affordable legal help, and there is a lot of, um, a lot of demand for what we do. This is our website. People go onto the website, they can click find a lawyer and then input information about themselves and their case. And then they get a listing of directory a directory of lawyers who practice in those areas. And then it is incumbent upon the prospective client to connect with those lawyers and see if it would be a good fit for representation. There are 26 active lawyers on our directory and three mediators. They are all experienced, have malpractice insurance, have positive client and professional references, and, they're, um, and we're really thrilled to have them all with us. We also cover a number of different practice areas, almost any area that is um, important for people of modest means is something that we are hoping to have lawyers and mediators who can address. So what's next for DC Refers? We're looking to grow by adding more lawyers and mediators to our panel and having more lawyers come to our website. We're also trying to grow by adding new board members. There are great reasons to be a part of our board. It's a fantastic team and really mission driven. So if you are interested, the website is there and I'll also put it in the chat. We invite you to connect with DC Refers through our mailing list, through social media, because we put information that is interest, of interest to people who, um, who might be wanting to know about modest means practice. And then you, we also have a YouTube channel where a lot of our past DC Refers Reconnect programs can be found and you can view them on demand. So that is a little bit about DC Refers. So then let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Nicole Stevens. Ms. Stevens is the Register of Wills and the Director of the Probate Division of DC Superior Court. She joined the courts in 2008 as the Assistant Deputy Register of Wills. Then in 2017, she was promoted to Deputy Register of Wills. And in February of 2020, she became the Register of Wills, which I'm sure was on the cusp of things that she couldn't imagine for the courts or our world. Before she came to the courts, she worked at Lowinger and Brand, PLLC, in private practices. She provided legal expertise and advice in landlord-tenant, real estate, business formation, and of course, probate matters. She was an elected member of the DC Bar's Estates Trust and Probate Steering Committee from 2011 to 2015, and remains an active member of the probate community. She has spoken on a number of panels on probate-related issues and is a graduate of American University, Washington College of Law, and Howard University. Ms. Stevens is admitted to practice in DC, New York, and New Jersey, and we are thrilled to have her join us today. And with that, let me hand the program over to Nicole Stevens. Oops, you'll have to unmute. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to begin by thanking uh, DC Rivers for providing this uh, opportunity to, to speak uh, about the probate division and, you know, bring some sunshine to our extraordinary little corner of DC courts. Um, for those of you not familiar with the probate division or my personal journey through this area of law, there are probably two things you need to keep in mind about probate. And you don't have to write these things down. You don't have to study. There's no notes. <laughs> this is just to inform you how the process works and um, what to expect from the outcomes, right? The first thing I'm going to tell you is that no one comes to probate because they want to. Anyone that comes to probate to file a case is dealing probably with tragedy, um, sadness, or, and unplanned, but not unexpected circumstances. The second thing is that probate's not about heirs or legatees or even assets like real property or personal property. You know, because we know everybody has the Fabergé egg hidden in the wall safe at, at home. <laughs> but um, probate is really about creditors and about finishing those things that a person did not get to complete because they died or they're found to be incapacitated and unable to carry on their own affairs. When I give an overview of probate, it doesn't matter to me whether my audience is full of attorneys or my relatives or just people who come into probate to look at all the um, wills that we have on the walls of all the famous DC citizens who have, um, who have died in the District of Columbia and had last ones and testaments. Um, I try to speak in the simplest of terms and I find it really important that I do this, especially for um, attorneys, <laughs> mostly because there aren't many probate practitioners anymore. Um, there are a lot of estate planners, there are a lot of wealth managers and trustees, but I know very few um, lawyers who can administer a decedent's estate from the beginning to the end. That that old time family lawyer that, you know, did your kids um, college fund and, and things like that and helped you do your last will and testament and helped your kids um, deal with your uh, deal with your estate. They, they, they just don't really exist anymore on, on, the, on the level that we used to see them on. Um, I'll start by saying that the probate division, the simplest definition is the legal process that takes place after someone dies. It usually involves probating a will or determining um, or determination of intestacy. It's identifying the decedent's property, paying outstanding debts, and if there's anything left over, those, those things go to the heirs at law or to the legatees in the will. But um, a lot of people don't understand that the probate, hand, probate handles a lot of uh, other fiduciary related matters, um, specifically, in, in, especially in the District of Columbia, guardianships and conservatorships of inc incapacitated adults. Um, so you wanna think Britney Spears, but better. We do it way better here in the district. Um, and estates of minors and trusts. Um, so you wanna think Jackie Coogan, the Little Rascals, for those people who go back that far, <laughs> and um, or Macaulay Culkin, who became emancipated at, at a young age and got control of his trust fund. And of course, we do wills here. The probate division consists of 13 different case types. That's how many we maintain. Um, they fall into four categories, decedents estates, um, interventions, which is the guardianships and the conservatorships, trusts, which are things like guardianships of minors assets, um, special needs trusts, and we have a major litigation case, uh, case type that is no different than um, if you would go to civil, plaintiff, defendant, only we deal mostly with probate matters. Overall, between the decedent's estates and the intervention matters, we have over 
8,000 open and active cases that we deal with. And um, for those two case types, for the decedents' estates, they're open for three years at least. And um, for interventions, guardianships, conservatorships, they're open for the person's lifetime. Next slide, please. The, um, the probate division is one of five operational divisions in the DC Superior Court. Unlike the other operational divisions, civil or criminal, probate is really a hybrid division. We have an administrative side and we have a compliance side. 40% of our personnel handle the day-to-day -day operations and case management. This is the administrative side of the division. This is straight court management, case management. It's no different than any other court, or maybe more like the DMV, <laughs> if you uh, want to use that analogy. They are frontline staff who have the majority of interaction with the, with the public. They are deputy clerks, and they're accepting new filings and issuing letters of appointment in the various case types. The other 60% of our personnel positions require specialized knowledge, skills, and abilities, and are tasked with the compliance duty. So you have the auditing branch, they audit accounts. Um, GAP, they review guardianship cases every three years and report the findings to the court. The legal review, the legal branch reviews all um, probate documents that uh, come in that deal with decedents' estates and they confirm that they meet the statutory requirements and are able to go to a judge for um, appointment. Um, the Register of Wills Office, I review wills. Um, the probate systems, we send data on our caseloads to other DC agencies and to the, the Superior Court um, leadership. And then we have the program analyst office, which provides, uh, which basically tries to keep us ahead of the, the curve, look at trends and move the, the court and the, the division towards continuous process improvement, doing really managing cases effectively and efficiently as possible, as is our mission. Lastly, our newest office, which is um, the one that um, we're really excited and most proud about, is the, um, is the self-help center, where our small estate branch is. It's been open since 2018. It's a place where um, self-represented probate filers who do not have attorneys can come and obtain information about the probate process and, and get access to fundamental and foundational materials about probate. They can get the help online, they can get it in person. Um, our small estate house is, is, our small estate branch is housed there. They, um, and they, provide, they can meet with these specialists in small estates and go through these smaller cases and not have to have an attorney involved. As we try to move back to our pre-pandemic status, we are excited to, in the fall, have our law students back. We did a um, program with GW that um, was very, very successful because we offered a lot of um, a lot of CLE credit, and which is really important in places like New York, if you're barred there and, and those places, um, that they could work towards getting those credits in, in our um, self-help center. It was a great experience for the filers because they, they really had someone to help them with their, their forms and to, um, in some cases, rep help them with one-time representation in court when they fail to um, meet some of their requ compliance requirements. We, um, the, the law students got the credit. They got to get that one-on-one -on -one time, learn, learn some attorney kind of bedside manner. <laughs> and uh, it, it was just a great experience overall. So much so right before the pandemic, we were about to expand to like four or five schools. <laughs> um, and we just, and we absolutely need the help in the self-help center. Um, and we're really looking to restart that program.
We also have a program for attorneys who wanna volunteer. Um, we know that our fiduciary panelists, those people that are appointed in these um, guardianship and conservatorship cases have a requirement to do um, uh, continuing education and part way they can also get that those credits is to come into the uh, self-help center and meet, especially with some of our intervention cases, people who are um, having problems um, dealing with not so much the hospital, but trying to find placement or trying to get authority over um, the care and maintenance of their parents, um, or they just got a lot going on and it, they can help them kind of put it together in a plan and work towards towards the end um, and get them in front of a judge. Next slide, please. One of the distinctions I also wanted to um, address was the difference between the Register of Wells and the Director of the Probate Division. Um, the Register of Wells is a statutory position that can be found in the DC code under title 11. The office of register of wills is housed in the probate division. The probate division is something completely different from the uh, register of, of wills office. And, and the role is very bifurcated when it comes to what I need to do in, in, for, for the courts and what I need to do as register of wills. I, I have a split personality, so to speak. What I, what I tell when I'm talking to judges, I tell them during the day, I am the director of the probate division. At night, when everyone's going home, I'm reading wills and I'm doing all those register of wills things that need to be, uh, need to be done. So um, just to go through the distinctions really quickly, um, again, you can find the Register of Wills in Title 11. You have to be an attorney. You have to practice for 10 years in the District of Columbia in decedents of state specifically in order to have the job. You're appointed um, by, by the Board of Judges. Um, so that's every judge in the Superior Court lines up and says you're okay for the job. Um, whereas in Maryland, for comparison, you are um, you are elected. The um, the in Maryland, the Register of Wills appoints PRs and 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 makes all those decisions. In DC, this is a judicial uh, probate jurisdiction. So in order to be appointed for anything, a judge has to be has to sign it. The only thing I do is make sure that it is um, it is statutorily correct and that that your um, your will is is um, meets the requirements of the statute. So that that's really it. As a director, I'm running around making sure that people's uh, people have case numbers or um, they got their hearing notice and all those things that any other director in the superior court. Um, would would do it is uh uh it's um it's i'm supposedly i'm the vision but a lot of time i'm also doing this the strategy the implementation and the planning as well so um that's really the distinction um next slide please And to wrap it up, I'm just gonna conclude this overview with a slide of resources. One of the things I like to stress um, when I discuss probate is that you never have to come to probate. <laughs> and the best thing you can do for your family is make it so they never have to come <laughs> to probate. Yes, put the register of wills out of business. <laughs> Make it so that um, everything is planned out and that, and that you do not have to come in in a state where um, it's just like, where do I go? What do I do? Um, we want people, we want people to, um, to really plan ahead, to, to think about what is going to happen after you're not here. Because probate is only the beginning. Filling out the, 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 
the petition and getting appointed, that's just the beginning of the journey. Um, once it's adjudicated on the merits, it's not like family court or any other court where you know you get a divorce and you never see the the judge again for us you got to report back you may have to do an accounting you um we're in there for life <laughs> especially in guardianship and conservatorships so if you look at the resources that are available there um you look at estate planning um the dc most get those do encourage people to do their um, advanced directives, to plan how they want things to, um, to play out if they ever become incapacitated. And they never have to come in and ask a judge. Um, a, a, a child, an adult child never has to come in and ask a judge because their parent planned it out. Same thing with um, probate. There are lots of transfer upon death deeds and um, a lot of things that can be done prior to so you don't have to bring your assets through um, probate um, through the probate division. So put those estate planners and wealth planners to work because when you look at the, 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 um, the code sections that we have, very small parts of them in Title 20 and Title 21 are about how you get appointed. Everything else is about how you comply with all these statutes, how you have to do accountings, how you have to um, tell us about the care and maintenance of, of your ward if you are a guardian. So the information you have is to, you know, is really what to expect and the other resources are for the public to really ob obviate the need to come into probate. And as I say to my son, as I, he gets out of the car to go to school, a lot, make good choices. This is a time for you to, um, now is the time to make those good choices. So I'll end there, because I know people probably have tons of questions to ask me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. I think if people want to put questions in the chat, we have a few minutes where we can do, do that. And while people are typing, there is one question that came in ahead of the program, which was to ask about what is happening with the archived cases and getting them from storage so that those cases can be reopened. So one really nuts and bolts kind of question for you. <laughs> so um, I think uh, I'm going to preface my question, but the answer by saying DC is a very unique place. Um, it when every the archive cases that we have once they go to archives they don't they don't belong to us anymore we have to ask for them back um like basically like a library system and this is the district of columbia so our library is actually the national archives of the united states of america that is where our files go and there are a number of um uh, facilities, federal facilities throughout the country. So um, when people request files, it can take weeks and sometimes it can take months for it to come back. Um, we we um, also have a small local um, DC archive um, that has a lot of the older stuff. Uh, but we only get an hour a week there to look up the number of cases that we are, um, we, um, the requests that we get. So um, we are working with them. Um, uh, just like anyone else, they have suffered from, you know, staff shortages due to, uh, you know, the pandemic and people working remotely. So we're really working on them with the system to get more time to get in there and a way to um, really locate those things in the federal system and to talk to them and, and try to get them to send us to send us more cases. Um, lots of times when people order now, we don't just order the one case, we order the whole box because there could be other cases in there. So we're trying as hard as we, we can, but that's just one aspect of probate that is, is, is pretty, the, more difficult for us to control since we have to depend on outside agencies to get those materials. But we're working on it. Trust me, it is not something that has fallen by the wayside. But it does take a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are, um, there's another question in the chat that um, I will read it and you can tell me if this is <laughs> too much in the weeds or not. I am not a probate okay. practitioner. And so <laughs> 
Um, the question is, what is your preference on submission of the VCNO publication proofs via e-filing? Having experienced rejected submissions with no reason for rejection and all the required documents were e-filed. Is that something you could speak to or is that a one specific case that's that's, that's very specific, but I I will speak <laughs> I will speak to it um, briefly. If the petition for um, if the if the verification certificate of notice that's a statutory document that's required to be filed under twenty DC Code seven hundred four <laughs> um, that must be filed. Um, you know, I, I think the probate division division is very new to electronic filing. We're very, we used to be very old school with paper and everything like, like that. So if it is completely filled out, um, including the, has my estate um, increased or decreased, you gotta circle that, right? <laughs> and it has to be signed by the right person and the proofs of publication with the race seal shaded in has to be attached. And you um and you you can absolutely e-file e-file that. But if you have additional court costs, you're going to have to bring that in because we do not have a way to do sliding scale court costs via e-filing. So if you are still getting a rejection and you think you've done all the things I said um, prior to, then um, you should call the division. You should call the um, operations division and ask to speak to the case processing supervisor who can um, go through why your matter was specifically um, rejected. You can also try probate inquiries, but that may take us a little while, a couple of days sometimes to get back to you because um, we have we get a lot of we get a lot of inquiries and we're a small staff unlike the um, larger divisions we only have about 10 deputy clerks who do this work <laughs> so um, it may take a little while I know I get stuff about the phones ringing and things like that um, yeah just just keep trying um, but email is always your best bet you can always send an email to the office of register of wills we will get me or my deputy director will absolutely answer your um, emails. And then Ms. Stevens, there are two questions about specific forms on the website, but I think what I'll do is flag those for you to review that if the if the updated sure, forms just, can just send them to me. That's a good I'll, thing for I'll, you to know. Um, but then I think our last question, since it's five o'clock, will be about the duty auditor. Is that person going to come back in person? And do you know what the timeline for that would be? The duty auditor at this time will not be back in person. Our duty auditor remains virtual. Um, you can contact the duty auditor, leave a message. They will call you back. Mr. Butler has personally called people back. He is the branch manager. Um, and you can, again, you can always contact us at the Office of, of Register of Wells. They, um, they, do, they, they are 100% virtual. They do not come into the office. We can also arrange a Zoom or a Teams meeting if you really need to have a kind of face-to-face -face with them. Thank you so much for joining us and for answering questions and giving us an uh, overview. It was really, really helpful. And um, I want to thank folks for coming to DC Refers Reconnect and keep DC Refers in mind. If you have people who need modest means, who are people of modest means who need affordable legal or mediation services. We love DC Refers at, uh, in the Probate Self Health Center. We have all the material and we do give it out. <laughs> all, right. all right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.